time we talk about the region, so-called region, the Middle East, immediately what we think of uh, is war, conflict, economic deprivation, occupation, civil wars, conflict, and so on and so forth. That has not been the story of the Middle East or the Middle Islamic world until about a century ago. In fact, this part of the world has produced some of the most enduring achievements of Islam, world culture and civilization in philosophy, in science, in education, in architecture, in many, many other fields. When you talk about Baghdad, Basra, or many parts of what we call the Middle East today, Damascus and other places, you go back a few centuries before and you see the luminaries of the world in many different fields of human knowledge have either come from this part of the world or have come uh, to this part of the world to produce culture, science for all. Um, and of course, we live in the age of insecurity because um, I will talk about this in more political terms, uh, but there is a sense of insecurity that comes from this conflict between heaven and earth, between ourselves, within our souls, because without making peace with the heavens, we cannot establish peace and security on earth. I know this is maybe too philosophical for this panel, but I wanted to emphasize this especially because the world feels insecure in the face of growing unilateralism, growing or rising racism. The might is right approach, that I am powerful, therefore I am right approach. That's what causes insecurity in the world. I feel insecure when I hear some world leaders or political leaders saying that I am superior to you because I have X, Y, Z. The world feels insecure when the leader of the most powerful country in the nation says to another sovereign nation that you wouldn't survive without us for two weeks. Yes. The world feels insecure about these things. And one has to take responsibility and one has to take this sort of political posturing to task before we talk about security in the Middle East, security in the Gulf, security here and there. The problem of security is a global problem. It's not just about Muslim countries, it's not just about Muslim nations or the Middle East. I feel very insecure when I see the rising tide of Islamophobia in Europe, when in fact Muslim minorities have tried their best to integrate into the societies in, in which they live. They uh, follow the laws and rules and regulations of the countries in which they live, they contribute to that society, they speak the language, they know the culture, history and everything, but they are still seen as outcasts. Yes, we have a problem of security, it's not just in the Middle East, it's everywhere. In fact, it is generated by the failures of regional countries, no doubt, and regional actors, but it's also exacerbated by the global power disequilibrium that we are seeing in the world today. You cannot establish order in any part of the world or impose it from outside if you do not have regional ownership. And if you are imposing your own one-sided agenda on any conflict, on any part of the world, whether it's in Africa or in Latin America or in Southeast Asia, you will end up in failure. We're in a situation where there are at least four major conflicts in the region, uh, Libya, Yemen, uh, Syria, which actually, to my mind, has become the linchpin of instability across the region. Um, Syria was a key player in the region. It is now the stage on which much of regional and global instability is played out in or on. Uh, we also have, well, Iraq, thankfully, is, seems to be at least moving, has taken one step in the right direction with the election of uh, President Barham Saleh and the uh, appointment of a new prime minister. Uh, we also have the long-standing occupation in, uh, uh, of Palestinian territories. So overall, the prospects for the incoming future, this is at the kind of more political global level, at the more societal level and socioeconomic level, this is, a le this is a region that is facing declining economic growth. The end of the rentier state is very much there. The rentier state was what, or rentier relationships were what marked the relationships between states and their citizens over decades, where citizens willingly gave up 
uh, or at least were encouraged to give up political rights in exchange for uh, social welfare. This is over now. We're seeing policies being implemented across the region that are removing subsidies um, uh, on, on, a large different, uh, on, on a large number of uh, uh, goods. Um, the, the people that, that, it, it, that are being impacted by this directly are the poorest of the poor. So violence, increasing violence at very different societal level. We constantly talk about non-state actors and what they're doing, but there's also state violence. I think what is needed today is for most regional players to at least come to the recognition that enough is enough and that if we continue along this path, everybody is going to lose. Right. right now, I believe it's mainly the people of the region who are losing. Right. Today, the biggest victims in Syria are the Syrians. It's not anyone else. Mm -hmm. They are paying the heaviest price for a war that they no longer control. Not sure they controlled it from the beginning, but it's a war that they no longer have any control over. So I think there's a point where regional players and international players have to come to the recognition that uh, continued instability, a political settlement that is not a just political settlement, that is not acceptable, that is acceptable, sorry, to a broad swath of the population, is one that will only sow the seeds of conflict for a very long time to come. Ani Mokhtar Lamani, you've heard a little bit from the other distinguished guests. Tell me, what does this mean, the shifting security situation? What is all this fragmentation? What is all this instability? And I was a witness in Syria, as well as in Iraq, to see one of the most dangerous thing, uh, sectarianism. Mm -hmm. Things are moving very strongly to sectarianism to push people even to identify themselves according to sectarianism than uh, national uh, dimension. There's also the danger of a disintegration of, of the country. And they ended by having a kind of wars by proxy. And nothing is working. If you see, as it was mentioned about Syria, the Syrians don't play any act. They are not actors anymore now with all the interventions. What is going to happen? Are they going to stay in the same uh, state? Or how, especially when I link it to the question of sectarianism, how things are going to be in 10 or 20 years? With the, and when you link it to the problems that exist now between Saudi Arabia and Iran with that sectarian dimension, not only even when you include uh, the final decision of the Israeli to have a Jewish state, you know, a religious, in a way, kind of religious state, where are we going uh, uh, in this part of the world? It's really scaring in which you see that even the, the notion of the uh, state as it was done right. after sykes Pico. Stefan de Mistura, unfortunately, you are the face of I don't want to use the word failed, but attempts to fix it that have not worked. You are the face of things being unresolved in Syria right now. When we see you on the TV, we know you're still trying and this war's still going. What does that mean when we look at the shifting security situation and is Syria at the heart of all of that? So let me address the point which I think is the most crucial one. I'm in the middle of it, so operationally. Timing. Timing is everything in life, in love, in friendship, in war, in peace. Timing is now. Why? Because we are getting not anymore in proxy war. Proxy war is over. Mm. Look at it. Look how many countries, how many armies are involved directly inside Syria today. Should I just mention five? They're all there, and in fact, the regional and international potential of a direct misunderstanding is enormous. That is dangerous, that is bad, but there's also potentially an opportunity for a wake-up call. And the wake-up call is taking place. Three million people moving. Turkey has got already very generously been handling three million people themselves. Another three million? at the very time when some countries are saying it's time for refugees to return and for re rehabilitation to start, at the very time you have new two million refugees, not sustainable. And when the bombing would take place and then you're talking about rehabilitation, not sustainable. And all that in front of the General Assembly, timing, 
And all that, when you had that major social mobilization, public opinion saying we cannot see another three times, five times what we saw in Aleppo, in Eastern Root and elsewhere. And on top of it, local people, women, civilians, mobilizing themselves inside Idlib, showing the candlelights on the doors and saying, we are people, we are not terrorists. And one million children there, we are children, not terrorists, help to create what I think needs to be sustained. So timing, October, November, are crucial for making sure that Idlib never becomes the final battle, but becomes instead the opportunity, a window of opportunity for what? A political process. So bottom line, this is a moment when we have to support the Idlib MOU. It needs to be sustained and kept alive because it gives us the feeling and the wind of opportunity to avoiding that the war ends with a war and starts instead with a new process called Constitutional Committee. Peace and justice. Are we sacrificing justice for peace? Does this mean that Assad doesn't face justice for his barrel bombs, that Russia doesn't get to be questioned about their role during the war? For millions of Syrians, that would be unacceptable. Is realpolitik at the heart of moving forward and making peace? Do you have to make these uncomfortable deals? You see this shifting policies of key players in Syria, uh, from United States to European countries to Gulf countries and others. Uh, and that creates not only confusion, but also a lot of chaos on the ground. What I mean by this is the following. Uh, United States said at one point that their goal in Syria is to fight Daesh, is to eliminate ISIS. Once Daesh was eliminated, largely, uh, they had to come up with another excuse or reason to stay in Syria. And it gradually evolved to a point where the American military presence in Syria is no longer about Daesh, because as they said, it has largely been defeated. Uh, and in the meantime, they continue to engage and support PYD, YPG, which is PKK Syria branch, which actually poses a threat, a direct threat to our national security. Uh, now they are saying that, well, they have to make sure that uh, Daesh is defeated in an enduring way. The enduring defeat of Daesh is the primary goal. But we know that deep down, that's not the main reason. The main reason is now to establish a military presence against Iran in Syria. Now you have, I agree, we have gone beyond the proxy war stage here. Actually, you have this country is now facing each other, if not fighting physically uh, in Syria. Therefore, nobody is talking about the Syrian people anymore. You're talking about the interests of great powers uh, through the Syrian territories and on the shoulders of the Syrian people. And this is really so inhumane. This is so unethical when you look at it from this point of view that even though we talk about there is no military solution, it's all about political solution, uh, to be honest with you, those who say this are the ones that continue the war on the field from the regime to others. Uh, so we have a big problem there. But the bottom line, I think, is the fact that a sustainable peace is possible only when it is based on justice. Compromising justice for peace, you end in losing both. In losing both. Actually, what has been going on is that we are fond of having what you call it quick fixes. But quick fixes never, never provide solutions to people. At a time when we are talking about basic matters and important matters, when the region is, is really losing confidence in international organizations, because international organizations issue international resolutions of the Security Council of the, of the United Nations, and many are really trying to, to really destroy them, and they are never implemented. So people are getting really less and less confident in international organizations. 
the region is really suffering from something. And the world has started to really be affected in one way or another through these changes that we are noticing in many European countries and in the States. And the whole, the whole theory that, that uh, uh, President uh, Trump is coming up is based actually as a reaction to what's happening right. in the rest of the world. So that's what I believe that we end up in looking at things the right way and try to find real sustainable solutions. Um, I want to just go back to the issue of and I, what, what, what Prime Minister Sanura said about no, you cannot have peace without justice. If you sacrifice justice for peace, you end up losing both. Um, for Syria, the Constitutional Committee is not the the kind of uh, you know the linchpin. It's not the it's not the golden uh, uh, the the the, uh, the answer to to everything. I think there are a lot a lot of other things that can be done uh, as the Constitutional Committee is going on, and even the credibility of the Constitution that comes out of this is going to be have a lot of question marks around it. Because when you're drawing up a Constitution in a, an environment where there's a victor vanquished mentality. Um, where there are uh, very little concessions to be made and where uh, the process of putting together the Constitution is, for many people, a, a big question mark. I mean, look at South Africa and the way that Constitution was put through. You need buy-in. People need to believe in this Constitution. So I think it's very important for Syrians to have the, the possibility of inputting, and I mean large numbers of Syrians, not just those who are actually working on this in the current environment. So it is important to continue moving forward on these issues, but without losing sight that questions of justice, but also international guarantees for people are also equally important, I think. Constitutional Committee is not the solution of everything, but it is the icebreaker, is the entry point, is the way through which you enter the DNA of a political solution. Because it does include all what we mentioned and needs to be accompanied by all of this. Having a Constitutional Committee meeting in Geneva is not enough. It needs to be accompanied by all that. Otherwise, people will not believe in it. But we need to start, and the timing is now during this window of opportunity. If we miss it, we go back to the military solution. That means perhaps military territorial victory, but no victory of peace, and no sustainability of peace. That means no rehabilitation, reconstruction, return of refugees, and a country divided. No way. Right. There's a fundamental disagreement among many people as to who the source of the insecurity might be. So, for example, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, sir, but in your speech you pinpointed Iran a lot as being a source of instability in the region. To, a, to, an, to another entire section and segment of the Middle East, the source of the instability is Saudi Arabia and their access and so forth. So, can we ever solve any of this without the fundamental parameters being agreed upon? One side believes Iran's the, the source of the trouble, the other Saudi and its allies. What we are facing in the Middle East, it's inside its state, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, and the approach, the approach on the ground, it's so far from the, again and again from the diplomatic conferences. Why? I'm going to tell you when the Russian and the Americans, and when I used to go to Geneva, I, I told them this, agreed about having Geneva to settle uh, uh, the question of Syria, uh, for both, Lavrov as well as Kerry, it became an objective. Lavrov said, okay, I'm going to bring the Syrian government and uh, the American were going to bring the opposition and we are going to have Geneva like an objective. What I was witnessing inside Damascus, the government doesn't want to go to Geneva, said well, if we are going to go just to please the Russian, there's no political will, and the armed group I used uh, to go, I have a list of the people of the uh, foreign, uh, the opposition outside Syria, tell me whom of these names you think represent you. I was so shocked to hear all the time, you know, these people, if they come to see us, we will slaughter them. This is part of the reality. Even within these conferences, if they reach an agreement, how are you going to implement it? Uh, the other thing, which is also very, very dangerous, and I mentioned in the beginning sectarianism, why? And uh, I'm going to talk about Iran and Saudi Arabia in this specific issue. When 
uh, the Syrian made the huge mistake to, to, open the, to open the doors of their country to a foreign uh, intervention. The groups I used to visit, they were 100% Sunni. And the militia that they were brought from Lebanon, as well as from Pakistan or Afghanistan or Iraq, the Nujaba, were 100% Shia. Uh, uh, and when you ask the people inside the country to see this kind of crisis, look in the example of Iraq, when they asked the Kurds, they wanted to have independence. It's for some regional stability that they were prevented from having their own independence. And in my view, the problem is much more complicated and more dangerous, mm. and I'm scared about the future. Well, in the short run, uh, certainly, we will uh, continue to support uh, the Geneva process led by uh, His Excellency Mr. Demistura. Uh, we will continue to work in the Astana process and bring them closer to one another. But I think in the long run, there are uh, some important steps we have to take, uh, hopefully, once we reach that point of political resolution. And that's where hope lies. I would like to end up, end up by saying two things. One thing I would like to borrow it, to borrow it from my experience in the field of finance, my prior experience. They say in the field of finance, you cannot appoint the manager who was responsible for the bankruptcy of the company to be in charge of rescuing it. Secondly, it's, the, it's a saying by Einstein that he says, you cannot solve your problems by using the same thinking that you used when you created them. Mm -hmm. Let's think of it. And let's work hard to regain hope and determination. And nevertheless, I am hopeful that we will reach. Thank you.